Well, while, while we have Bob, while we have, we're talking Connecticut, I wanted to ask Bob Nagel if he would just speak to an issue because he was associated, his community was a not-for-profit. Do you mind doing this, Bob? Because I'm springing this on you. But he was, he was, their community was a not-for-profit associated with the hospital. And then big things happened in his community and he was a shaker and a mover. And uh, I just thought he should share that with you. Now let's face it, we are not owners. You can say, hey, it's our money. Uh-uh. We made a deal. We signed a contract. We are not owners. We are customers. What's unique? As customers, the success of CCRC, an individual CCRC, is a win-win cooperation between the owner and the residents. And we might put one other thing in there. I use a triangle. You got the residents, you got the owner, and you have the manager. Very often, there are differences between manager and owner. But those three entities have to work together. And when that happens, you've got a good business model. And remember, word of mouth advertising, if you don't have a good service in your CCRC, and at the next cocktail party, the next social gathering, all you need is one or two people saying, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't get that. That word of mouth advertising hurts. Same token, you can't go out and attack the owner or the manager if you perceive of a disagreement. You're just hurting yourself. You're hurting your own CCR's reputation. So that's the balance we have. From the owner's standpoint, he needs resonant support to have a success. We're, we're, the, we're the sales organization for the CCRCs. Yes, there's a marketing department. But we, what we say about where we live is the most important. Okay, <laughs> you asked me up here on another question. Um, in the case of the Stanford Health System, the owners of the Stanford Hospital, um, they had the concept in 1994-93 of providing medical service to all the citizens of Stanford on the basis of all the way from birth to hospice, of the end of life. They didn't buy a cemetery, they stopped there. But from the rest of it, they had it. <laughs> they found not all of those facilities were profitable. They had a deficit problem. The board of directors had to make a change in the manager, brought in a whole new team. I should say, the CCRC concept came out of that concept of going from birth all the way to a nice retirement life. That's where the CCRC came in. That board, that operator was removed. And the new board looked at all of the facilities that they had acquired uh, nurses' quarters, doctors' offices, hospice, so forth, visiting nurse, that was all cut. And at that point, in around 2000, uh, 2002, um, they said, we're going to sell Edge Hill. I have been on the finance committee since I came to Edge Hill in 2000. I've gone through at least eight proposals to buy Edge Hill. We have met with various, various providers on a national basis that looked at us. Um, 
they wanted us to form, uh, us, the residents, to form a corporation and buy the uh, Edge Hill. We looked at that twice, went into the financing of it, we said no. The upshot was that we almost came to a purchase with the Jewish home Fairfield, which would have retained our 501c3 status. That fell through in 2010, um, 11, when money was tight. And finally, a gentleman, a Tom Gray, that is the owner of Benchmark out of Wellesley, Massachusetts, who had tried to buy Hedge Hill back in 2002, finally made an offer that the operating head of the hospital called me and said, Bob, come on over here today and uh, you're going to be sold. We're going to go with Benchmark. And uh, that started roughly two years of negotiation. Fortunately, the owner, uh, Stanford Hospital, we worked with a committee, I put a committee together, and we did have adequate representation, which was strictly on their basis. They just invited us in to do that. Some of the evergreen woods was much different, and um, East Hill Woods, 3030 Park, those were very different. But we've had six changes of ownership in, in Connecticut. I think what Roots is particularly <laughs> interested in my saying on this, and I repeat, as residents, change of ownership as far as we took it through four lawyers in two in the state of, three in the state of Connecticut, state law applies, and one at uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, Leading Age, Boss, uh, the attorney, we don't have any rights. What was very difficult about this, and it's still an open question. Edge Hill has been superbly successful since incorporation. It was the right solution to the Greenwich, Stamford, Darien, Fairfield County in the year 2000. We filled up in less than six months, filled up went to a waiting list in six months. Uh, we've never had a deficit year. So by the year 2012, we had collected $27 million in cash, short and long-term investments on the balance sheet. Under the rules in Connecticut, and I'm pretty sure nationally, if a 501c3 sells another 501c3, which was a relationship we had, we have a large 501c3, Stanford Hospital, smaller one, Edge Hill. For magnitude, we bill out about 20, or Gross revenue is 24 million. So roughly at 24 million a year, we had collected surplus of 27 million. In a sale, the larger 501c3 that started us kept all of that money. That was their money. And the best we could do with negotiation is they said, we'll give you residents a half million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars per year for five years 
If you say one negative word, if you want to write one letter to the department, to the letters to the editor, local papers, local radio, local television, you don't get the 500,000. We are in, we get the fourth, we get the last one in the year, two, the last payment, 2015. We have some plans at that point. <laughs> but this is not the only. This happened at uh, East Hill Woods up in Southbury, Connecticut, when they were purchased by um, we're benchmark, their watermark. Um, Got to be careful. They had nine million on the books. The residents didn't get to keep it. The new buyer didn't get to keep the nine million. That had to go to another 501c3, and they chose a local charity in the Southbury area. That is the way the law is set up now. So if you want to think of a business plan, establish a 501c3. In fact, establish two of them. And make that first one very profitable. Whatever way, through good operation, raising fees, whatever. Now in a 501c3, I think you all know, you can't take money out. You can do arm's length transaction, but the money that is generated, hopefully revenue over expenses, <coughs> pass the state for the benefit of the 501c3. That's why you have a tax exempt status. So how, if you have a profitable, profitable 501c3, how do you get the money? Sell it. And if you're a 501c3, you get to keep that money. If you sell it privately, then any excess on that has to go to another 501c3. Is it a difficult time for residents? I think our committee would be very happy on the performance that we had, that we think we did go through the transition. Benchmark has been a good new owner, but we went from a 501c3 to private ownership. We haven't lost anything in occupancy or reputation, as far as I know. It's traumatic, but it can be handled. Question. So Benchmark has bought up in Massachusetts a program that is in a similar difficult financial situation, expanding it to put on a nursing home as well. So my question is, you are now four years with Benchmark? We are wholly owned by Benchmark. We're in LL. How many years? Four years? Um, yeah, four years. Yes, going on four years. So Okay. Benchmark has been a good owner. The one of the conditions that we as residents put on the sale, we listed five million dollars worth of improvements at the point of purchase. They agreed to that, they have kept that. They have been a good owner, we have been satisfied. We are a bit upset with the monthly Month, monthly increase. The last one, which is effective January 1st, 2014, was 4.8%. And we had to fight to work that down from day one and over five. And I challenged them on the basis that the pro forma 
for the next five years, which must be in the disclosure statement, shows an increase approximately 6% each year. They want, now this is only benchmark, they want a 10% return on sales per year. They are interested only in cash flow. Plus, keeping a good reputation. The $27 million that you lost, was that in the foundation? Was that um, for supporting fund or capital fund? What was that for the money? That was in three accounts, cash, short, and long-term investments. It was on the balance sheet, nothing else. They received they sold it for $71.5 million, plus they kept $27 So what, the roughly 12 years of operation, they turned with the zero equity into $100 million. All right, so that money had been built up by donations? From no, operations. Operations. Right. Okay, so it was part of operations. It was our monthly fees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have, do you have a supporting fund or a foundation or anything? No. No, we're separate. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Oh, you could do the No, not right. Okay. Um, the transfer of ownership is traumatic. It can be done, I think, somehow, NACRA on a national level, certainly contra on the state level, we're trying to work out some protection for residents in change of ownership. So, no more questions. I thank you for your time, thank Ruth. You. <laughs> I just thought you should share some of that with you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.